well, it's time for Talking Pints with a very enthusiastic Norwich audience. And I'm joined by Stuart Agnew, Norwich born and bred, farming family, and of course been a politician for ten years as an MEP, and he was at school with King Charles at Gordonston. So there's a heck of a lot to get through. But Stuart, welcome. Uh, and tremendous to be here, thank you. Good, no, delighted to see you. Delighted to see you. Now, Norfolk farming. This was, this was you know, clearly in the blood, and you've had brothers that have been Norfolk farmers. And What state's Norfolk farming in today? They have been battered by the two events. One is the sudden increase in the price of nitrogen fertiliser, which is a byproduct, of, a byproduct of something else that's not being produced. And then, of course, there was the Ukraine war, yeah. which, for arable farmers, if they hadn't sold their grain before that war they saw a doubling in prices, but for livestock farmers who were having to pay that double price, it has been Pretty disastrous, tough. really, for pigs yeah. and poultry. Norfolk has a huge population of outdoor pigs, and, of course, a lot of poultry. I mean, Bernard Matthews and these bootful turkeys, you know, all yeah. that's here. Okay. And, and they struggled to try and get the money they needed from the supermarkets who wanted to keep their prices down yeah. because people were experiencing cost of living and they were caught in a terrible vice and no, many no, have gone out. Hard. I'm going to come back to farming but before you became a farmer you were packed off to Gordonston <laughs> and you were put into a class aged 13 with a young Prince Charles. Now I bet a few here have watched The Crown and have, and have seen this sort of portrayal of this brutal institution. How did you survive, Stuart? I, I didn't like it, I have to tell you. <laughs> um, but to be, if you watch The Crown, there was, a, I think, an excerpt there that said he ducked out of a cross-country run. That's rubbish. He didn't. That boy was duty-driven. He never would have done that. And if he had, we'd have been talking about it throughout the rest of the five years. Yeah. He never did that. So it was pretty grim there, was it, genuinely? I, I found it tough, I must say, yes. And you're pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, there was morning run in the morning. At quarter to seven, a bell would ring. The only furniture we had in the dormitories was the bed, the blanket, we were, and we had to have our gym shoes and running shorts, and we had to get up and go for an early morning run. Uh, towards the end of the Christmas term, somebody was allocated to injure themselves on the morning run, and if they did that... There was no more morning run for the rest of term. I drew the short straw because I was at a dormitory which, where we had to run past the housemaster's flat to join the rest of the lot. And I ran into one of those steel cylindrical dustbins and drew blood and made a huge noise. And, of course, I was a hero for the rest of the term because they captured the morning run. <laughs> King Charles, as he now is, you were there with, I think, four years you were in the... In the yeah, five, in, the same academic... And a very small yeah, yeah. class. You got to know him pretty well. What did you make of him as a person? Oh, I, I thought that he handled it well. I, I did... At those days, I did admire him. I think he talks a lot of rubbish now, I have to say, but He's then... King Charles! Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> but, you know, he could never duck out of anything. He always handed his prep in on time. He was expected to take the lead part in a Shakespeare play. He was expected to sing a solo in the choir. He was expected to master a musical instrument. He was expected to do well academically. And he, everything he could do, he did as well as he could. He wasn't sporty, which is a disadvantage in a school like that. But, you know, I give him full marks for really trying hard. Oh, that's good to hear. Well, I tell you what, he's going to need a lot of perseverance and strong will, because if I read the front of today's Guardian, and if I go through the Guardian, this is now an outright attack from the left on the institution of monarchy just 30 days before Charles's coronation. And, you know, it, they're revealing money the royals have earned, links hundreds of years ago with slavery. And he's going to need a lot, a lot of resolve to get through all of this. And I hope and pray that he does, and I believe that he will. And even if, like Stuart, I might disagree with some of the points he makes. I think he's fundamentally a good man. Oh, yes, he is. He's duty-driven. <laughs> now, Stuart, you survived Gordonston, but you wanted more danger. <laughs> so off you go to, to, to India, and then you finish up in South Africa, Rhodesia, and the events that were taking place down there with that Rhodesian bush war were 
truly horrific, weren't they? Yes, and my job there was a, a soil and water conservation officer with the Minister of Agriculture, and I was posted up to a town called Karoy, which is just south of the Kariba Dam, and the, the terrorism was just getting going, it, it, and it took the form of landmines being laid in the dirt roads, and if you drove over one of those, you were dead. And we only had a limited number of mine-proof Land Rovers for civil servants like me who worked out in the rural areas. And it was a pecking order. If you had a wife and children, you were top of the list, wife next down. But myself and the livestock advisor, we were both bachelors, and so we didn't get them. And as I, I was mainly working out on frontier farms, pegging their contour banks, we were going on a lot of dirt roads. The tarmac roads were fine. They didn't dig them up. Yeah. The dirt road... That was where the problems were, so I thought I need a good spotter in the cab with me, and I found an old vehicle number plate and put it up against a tree. I had a staff of 10 or 12, and individually I kept bringing them nearer this number plate. What does it say? What does it say? And the chap who read it first was an old boy who I didn't really expect. I just brought him in so not to hurt his feelings. He had milky film on his eyes. He read it, and so he sat next to me as a spotter, um, the problem was with him, he had terrible body odour. <laughs> well, uh, as, we as we were driving along the tarmac road, you could wind the window down. <laughs> but once we got on the dirt road, all the m dust and muck came well, in. maybe he saved your life. He uh, did, three times. Yeah, and, yeah. and what was happening down there was truly horrendous. Mm. I don't want to dwell on it. Back in farming, you become active. You've always been a man of opinions. You become the Norfolk representative with the National Farmers Union. You mentioned earlier, you know, the problems with, with costs, the Ukraine war. But I'm looking at what's happening in the Netherlands, where they want to cut the number of livestock, they want to cut CO2, they want to cut nitrates. Where does this leave farming? I mean, you know, we, we have to go for net zero, Stuart. We have to save the well, planet. Well, we don't have to if, if we can stop it. I mean, we are a democracy, and if the stupidity of net zero can be conveyed to the electorate and exactly what it will mean to them, and in the Netherlands it means drastically reducing farming output. Their very best thing they do is wonderful soil. They do a superb job. Yeah. And what really gets me about this is that they could grow these crops with using less nitrogen and less pesticides if they were allowed to use modern plant breeding methods, gene editing and genetic modification. So it's the Greens who would tell them, oh, you're polluting, yeah. you must stop. And then the solution to that, the Greens say, oh, you can't do that. Uh, the, gre the, the green lobby are our are, are enemies. But you I have are a say. global warming sceptic, aren't you? Absolutely. No, no, I, the planet's warming. My scepticism is the contribution of CO2 to that warming. It's a trivial cause of climate change. It's our solar cycles, the jet streams, the ocean currents, and other things are far more important. And has anyone in here ever heard a weather forecaster say, ooh, carbon dioxide levels are here, here. we're going to get such and such a weather. You <laughs> never hear that, do you? You never hear it. And can I please show you something I've got here? Briefly. Right, OK. <laughs> this, this is a satellite map of where the carbon dioxide hotspots are. Yep. And they are exclusively over the tropical rainforests. That's where the hot spots are. All the, the um, organic matter deteriorating. Hold it up. Hold it up. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. The bottom map, the top yeah. map is where the experts thought it was going to be. And the point being, Stuart? The point being, you look at the CO2 levels over India, yeah. 1,400 million people burning coal. Look at the CO2 levels over central Australia where nobody lives and nobody does anything. They are identical. All right. Well, Stuart, a lot of people disagree with you, but it's interesting. I want to hear it now. Given those strong views, given those strong views, it's no surprise that when you and I met in 1999 that you immediately signed up for UKIP. And you go from being, you know, an active Norfolk farmer, ten years in the European Parliament. I think you rather enjoyed it. It was a massive shock to begin with. I didn't know where I was walking into... Didn't you turn up on the first day at Eurostar in, pa in, in St Pancras? Don't tell them, no, oh, come on. <laughs> he, he turns up without a passport. <laughs> And what's more, he leaked it to the press. He turns up without a passport and says, I've got a jolly important meeting in Brussels with Nigel Farage. <laughs> and they let him on Eurostar. Yeah, they did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuart, you're right. I, 
I thought the story was so wonderful, I did leak it to the press. <laughs> <laughs> final, th final thoughts, Stuart. Cricket, great love of your life. You're still active in Norfolk Cricket. Yes, I'm the chairman of Castlecker Cricket Club, and we just had a promotion to, into another league. Um, I'm the scorer as well, and the trouble is I'm not a nerd. I love my book with all the colours. Now I have to use some um, wretched... <laughs> tablet or something and, and I, I am struggling so I'm going to go on a course because the, the club expect it because if you use one of these tablets it's broadcast on the internet people can find out See, what's going on yeah, as, yeah, it's, live. As, as it's happening yeah the worrying thing though is that is this racism in cricket I know all the captains in Norfolk were brought together um must be tough on racism but where does banter end and racism begin we debated this with pat pocock former surrey and england mm. cricketer on the show on monday of this week and you're absolutely right Stuart agnew we could talk for hours in times gone past we have talked for hours Thank you. and possibly <clears throat> have more than half a glass whilst we were doing it. <laughs> uh, but it's lovely to see you and it's great to be in your home county of norfolk for talking pints thank thanks you for much. having me Thank you.